coming up on today's episode. It's been three o'clock on the Saturday to, I think I'm going to put coffee on the Saturday night. So I can't, if he got up and he had maybe blood from his face or if he um, had a black eye or something like that, I understand that. But if you had to choose one or the other, that was an unnatural position or unnatural movement, it would really be soft, then they wouldn't get fed. That part a strong comment, but they're quite funny at the same time, actually. Cool, that's a soft shot. Well, he's on a wheel. Um, like, he wouldn't do that to his son. At the end of the day, it's your son, you should do that kind of thing. So I think he's all having a long time, a bit of a digger. I don't know if you're right, but I don't know. There's a new chip leader, guys. A new chip leader. And uh, proving he can do it without that cleavage. Yes, guys, welcome back to TIFC. I'm Coach Indy. You're watching another episode of the Premier League Appetizer Show. Today's show, we're talking some injury news, lots of injuries picked up again over the last week or so. We're touching on Indy versus the rest of the world, which was, let's just say, is an absolute belter and lots of points scored from one party, let's just say that. Um, also, looking at game week 31 results and looking ahead to game week 32 fixtures, and also we're talking about some other news, and in fact, that's where we're going to be starting. Before we get stuck into today's episode, I need you all to hit the subscribe button and click that notification bell. It does help the channel grow that little bit further. And also click that like button as well. The more likes we get on the video, the more it reaches people's timelines, therefore we get more views and more subscribers, etc. Just try and help the algorithm um, on YouTube as well. And obviously there's going to be opportunities to comment at the end of the episode as well, so please do so. Without further ado, let's dive in. Okay, other news then guys, there's a few things to sort of talk about here. First thing to talk about is the passing away of Prince Philip, which is obviously devastating news all across the world, obviously, in particular in the UK. Um, it was age 99 and was close to being 100, actually, a few months short of that. Had absolutely great innings, but he's obviously had a, a brilliant life and passed away peacefully, etc. But the way that that sort of affects football um, going forward is the funeral is taking place this Saturday, which is in a few days' time. The Premier League, the EFL, the Scottish League, etc., they've all sort of cancelled their three o'clock kickoffs to allow for the funeral um, and show their respects on that side. So the funeral takes place at three o'clock on the Saturday. Any game that was a kick off at three o'clock, so there would I think it'd only be one Premier League game, but there'd be loads of you know League One, Championship, League Two, Scottish games, etc. They've all been moved around. So they're all gonna be moving around to either early kickoff on the Saturday, which is still okay. Um to a Friday night kick off or possibly even a Sunday. So I think the EFL are allowing clubs to organise that themselves, obviously within a reason. Um, and some clubs have already done that already. So like I said, some have moved to Friday night, some have moved early kick off Saturday, etc. The Premier League game is just moving from three o'clock, which is between Wolves and Sheffield United. That's moving from three o'clock on the Saturday to I think it's an eight o'clock kick off on the Saturday night. So, night. so that's plenty of time for you know both teams to sort of get organised and arrange, make arrangements, etc. Um, yeah, I mean the other thing I want to talk about is the shambolic decision made. Now, you, I don't want to blame anyone in particular, whether it's a referee, VAR, a combination of everybody, or whatever. The shambolic decision made in the Man United or the Spurs Man United game, where I don't know if you guys have seen it, but Son gets brushed aside, you know, in a movement that I would say is fairly natural in a game of football from Scott McTominay, and it hits. Son's face, eye, that kind of area, but he's down for like three minutes. Um, which I understand if, if he woke, if he woke, woke up, if he got up and he had maybe blood pouring from his face, or if he um, had a black eye or something like that. I understand that a bit more, but there was no scratch, there was nothing really there. And to rob something the wounded further, United actually scored from that, and it was obviously taken to VAR, and they slowed it down, which they always do, which obviously exaggerates the, the incident even further in a negative way, either way. Um, and the goal was disallowed and obviously that Man United were fuming and they didn't play well at that particular moment anyway and I don't want to say anything about the result just yet but yeah it's a really really bad bad decision I think everyone in part of the officials and you know people who are making the decisions are seeing that as a free kick and everyone else has not seen it everyone thinks it's a, you know, a fair movement and action or we wouldn't call it in actual fact probably what I will say is I will probably say out of the movement from Scott McTominay's right hand and Son's left or right hand, Scott McTominay is in more of a natural position as opposed to Son. So if anyone made the foul, it's probably more Son. I'm not saying that Son's was a foul either, by the way. Neither were the fouls. But if you had to choose one or the other, that was an unnatural position or unnatural movement, it would be Son. So 
yeah, that really, really, really annoyed me, especially as a Man United fan. Um, even, I mean, I'd probably be less annoyed if I wasn't a Man United fan, but in the moment I was so frustrated, so annoyed. Um, but yeah, we're going to move on because I don't want to get too drawn up about that. But the, the social the social comments after the game was hilarious as well. Like he obviously he spoke about it. And Jeff uh, Shreves, who's Sky Sports journalist, asked about it. He obviously wants a reaction. You can try and make some headlines, etc. We get that. That's what the media do. Um, but social comments afterwards was if it takes ten of my teammates to go and pick him up after being on the deck, um, then not. I wouldn't feed him. So I use the analogy of his son. Like if his, if his son went down and took 10 of his friends to pick him up, then they wouldn't get fed. And I thought it was a bit strong comment, but quite funny at the same time, actually. Go on, just some shot. All he's on a wheel. Um, yeah, so that was quite funny, actually. And then obviously, Mourinho had actually initially given his press conference to the television broadcasters, but then he got asked um, in his post-match with the, um, the newspapers on the reaction of what Solskjaer said, and he wasn't happy either, so he, he said he had already had words with Solskjaer and told him his feelings, etc. Um, and I think he's kind of insinuated that like he wouldn't do that to his son. He said, at the end of the day, it's your son, you shouldn't do that kind of thing. So I think he's all having a, like, a bit of a dig at fatherhood, if you like, I don't know. Moving on, actually, because there's lots to talk about, guys. Um, just one other thing, one more positive case um, in the latest round of COVID tests. That was Ruben Neves of Wolves. Now, they seem to have quite a lot of Wolves throughout the season. But yeah, he's going to miss probably the next league game as well. Yeah. Moving on to some injury news then, guys. So it's just constant. Like last night, Dominic Cavalier in DCL, he missed a game. I'm not sure what the injury was. Maybe you guys will know more about that. Leave it in the comments. I'd love to know just so it helps the old fantasy teams, you know what I mean, um, going forward. So yeah, he missed a game, which was a shock. Um, Pedro Neto in the last game for Wolves, he came off for a knee injury and it's since come out that he's now going to need knee surgery, he's going to miss the range of season and could possibly miss the Euros for Portugal as well, which is a huge, huge blow. More so for Wolves, less so for Portugal, just given the depth they've got there. Kieran Tierney, um, he missed, he came off, I think, in the last Europa League game, missed the league game um, at the weekend, and then now it's now come out that he's probably going to miss the remainder of the season, or he's going to miss the remainder of the season. I'm not sure exactly what this injury is, but he will miss the remainder of the season. Fingers crossed he's available for Scotland in the Euros. Um, Nick Pope missed the game for Burnley as a goalkeeper. I think his was more of an impact injury, but it pushed his shoulder. Um, and then Trezeguet for Aston Villa, the, the winner who came on and scored um, a couple of goals a couple of game weeks ago. He got an injury and he's probably going to need surgery and probably going to miss the rest of the season as well. So um, I don't think Egypt have got a major tournament during the summer. I could be wrong there. Um, but hopefully, if they have it, they'll probably be in the later part of the summer after the Euros and he'll probably be fit by then, um, provided it's not too serious. But again, there's a constant theme here, guys. There's injury after injury after injury, and we spoke about it in the last episode, the load and the impact and the, the lack of recovery time between each of the sort of games, if you like, um, and, the, and the amount of sort of high-intensity runs Premier League footballers are required in this day and age is just, it's just mammoth. And I think this trend will continue. There'll be lots more injuries, not just the remainder of this season, but going into the next three, four, five, ten seasons, I think the trend will continue. The game will become more physical, um, and there'll be more injuries. Okay, moving on to Indy versus the rest of the world results. Game 31. I touched on it earlier. Had a bit of a belter. Not me personally, but just the, the game week was quite good. Um, this week's guest was Tim Jeffries. I worked with him in the past in terms of coaching and stuff. And um, Yeah, good lad. Man United fan as well. So, I'm going to dive straight in. Friday night game. Fulham versus Wolves. Now I went for a Fulham win 2-1. He went for Wolves to win 2 0, finished 1 0 to Wolves. Troy scored in the last minute. Um, so he picks up two points. Man City versus Leeds, both went for City wins. I went 3 2, he went 3 1. Obviously, finished 2 1 to Leeds, so zero points there. Liverpool versus Villa, both went for Liverpool wins. I went 3 1 to Liverpool, he went 2 1 to Liverpool. So I picked up two and he's picked up five. So I'm off the mark, he's up to seven. Palace versus Chelsea, I went for a 1 1 draw. He went for an edgy Chelsea 1-0 sneaky win um, and it was nothing close to that. So it's actually Chelsea won the game 4-1. So he's got the, the result um, right, not the scoreline. So Tim's picked up 2, I picked up 0. Burnley versus Newcastle. Both went for Burnley wins. I went 2-1, he went 2-0 and obviously Newcastle won the game 2-1. So we don't pick up any points there. 
West Ham versus Leicester. They both went for Leicester wins. I went 2-1, bit of a closer game. Tim went for 3-1 Leicester, and ended up being 3-2 to West Ham. Going the Hammers, uh, Dan Young's the last guest on. Would be very, very pleased with that. We'll touch on the results and, and the implementations of all the you know, European positions, etc. later on. So again, neither of us picked up any points there. Spurs versus Man United. Uh, I went for a Desmond 2-2, he went for a 1-1. And it finished 3 1 to United, which I'm absolutely buzzing about. Um, but we don't get any points there, so we we'll keep moving on. Sheffield United versus Arsenal. I went for a 2 1 win to Arsenal. Tim went for a 3 0 win to Arsenal. Another late goal, which has helped Tim get five points. The so Tim's went at five, I've picked up two. West Brom versus Hampton. I've gone for a 2 1 to Hampton. And he's gone Desmond 2 2, and obviously finished 3 0 to, to West Brom, which we were completely wrong about there. So neither of us picked up any points. And then Brighton versus Everton, I went for a 1-1, he went for a 1-0 win to Everton. He picks up zero, I picked up two. So, scores on the doors for the week is as follows. So just a reminder, going into the game week, I had a six-point advantage, 241 plays, 2-3-5. Now this week's results, I've only picked up six points. So I picked up three twos, which is really, really disappointing actually. One of my lowest scores in a very, very long time. I said last week, I picked up one of my highest scores. That's one of my lowest scores. Uh, and Tim for the rest of the world has picked up a, a decent 14 points. Um, so what that means for the community scores for the season, there's a new chip leader, guys, a new chip leader. So like I said, I had a six point lead. Now uh, the scores on doors are on 247 and the rest of the world are on 249. So they've got a two point advantage um, over myself. Again, this is getting nitty gritty stages, guys. Six more game weeks to go. Things can drop and change a little bit, but you don't want to get away from it too much now. Five picked up, the results have sort of flipped, and I've got 14, and Tim only got six for the rest of the world. I mean, what, eight points plus six? I've been a 14 points lead um, going into obviously the next game week. And granted, six weeks you can you know gain two or three every week and even towards the end of the season, but it's a big lead at that stage of the season. Um, thanks for Tim for getting involved. Very, very good predictions. Um, couple of fives in there as well with the Arsenal game and the Liverpool game as well so well done Tim. I'm going to move on to game 31 results then. So let's find those bad boys. Okay so touch on the Friday night game Fulham versus Wolves finished 1-0 to Wolves. Probably a bit of a must win game for Fulham. I touched on it last episode. The fact that they were playing before Newcastle and the rest of the teams in and around them but in particular Newcastle could have put some pressure on the likes of Newcastle. Um, and I think they would have taken them outside the relegation zone on goal difference. So it's a massive game. Obviously, Wolves have won it. Troy scored the last minute. Um, it's a good win for Wolves, actually. So it just alleviates a bit of pressure on them because they were slowly sort of... I, I don't think they were going to get relegated, but they were slowly getting sort of sucked into it. Um, so, yeah, just alleviate some pressure off them. And disappointing for Scott Parker. Uh, moving on to the Saturday, Saturday games. Early kick-off Man City versus Leeds. Now, Stuart Dallas, absolute brace and a half. Um... Leeds obviously had a man sent off as well, and I think it was Cooper, the, the captain, got sent off um, just on the stroke of half time. But they, they were quite resolute, defended differently, and I think they kind of had to enforce to in some ways. Normally, obviously, Leeds, we know what they play like with that murder football and high energy and high tempo and unforgiven attacking philosophy that Bielsa demands. But they have kind of played a little bit different, which was interesting to see. But they won the game 2 1, and that's three wins in a row for Leeds and moving them into the top 10. A little blow for Man City, nothing to be. You know, the alarm bells aren't ringing or anything like that just yet. Still got a decent um, lead. Uh, I'm just going to say, I saw a tweet actually. And I'm not saying this can happen. I don't, I wouldn't put my mortgage on it at all. But uh, I saw this tweet from a journalist. I think his name is Samuel. Um, he works in the Manchester area. And he said, if Man United, at the time, Man United had two games in hand after this result. And I think the points difference was 14 points. He said, if Man United win their two games in hand, that puts it down to eight points with six games to go. And if you cast your minds back to the Aguero goal and the season Man City won the league, um, that season then, Man City were eight points behind with six games to go. And he's like, could it happen? Kind of thing. I don't think it can happen, but I thought it was quite interesting to, to share that comment. Moving on, Liverpool versus Villa. Trent scoring a last minute goal um, to win the game. Um, and actually, about the first three games of the weekend, so the Wolves game, City game, and the Liverpool game, all had stoppage time winners, which was quite interesting. Um, and Liverpool now won three in the, in the spin of the league, so that puts them right in the mix in terms of the top four. And um, Watkins scoring again for Villa, 
uh, proven he can do it without Jack Grealish. So many people saying he can't. Not me personally. I think he's a very, very complete striker, and he's destined to move to a, a bigger club, in my opinion. <coughs> yeah, moving on to uh, Palace versus Chelsea. Really good result for Chelsea, especially on the back of last week's Premier League defeat against West Brom. Obviously, ran out four-one victors. Pulisic getting a brace here. I think um, Zuma scored as well from set piece, and Kai Havertz actually been quite influential in the game as well. Palace were not really non-existent, especially in the first half. They obviously did get one consolation with Benteke. I think that was their only shot on target throughout the game as well, which obviously being a home team, you want to have a bit more than that. Um, but nevertheless, it doesn't really mean too much for Crystal Palace. They're not going to get sucked into it. They're kind of in that middle position where nothing really matters. Only maybe one or two positions they can really finish and alter really. And obviously that's a few million pounds, depending on where you finish in the league as well. So I suppose that's what they're fighting for at the moment. Obviously, Chelsea has a good win. It pushes them. Um, yeah, I think at the time, Liverpool won their game. They were going into the top four. Chelsea won their game. They were in the top four. The pressure was on West Ham, um, who played, obviously, um, on the Sunday, which we'll move to not quite yet. We've got Burnley versus Newcastle. I thought Burnley win this game. I thought the way they're playing, um, especially the, the, the sort of positions in the league, I think it, they would find that edge. But because Burnley have had this change um, in the way they play, um, the DNA and the philosophy has changed a little bit. They're a bit more expansive. The Vidra's come in, I think that's a really smart decision. He's the best finisher at the club, I think, in terms of the corporate strikers. And he complements Wood quite well as well. And I think Wood had um, got the assist for Vidra's goal to put them 1-0 up. Um, but then Newcastle turned it around and St Maxwell getting a goal and an assist shortly after he came on. So, change the game, good win for Newcastle, puts them sort of six points clear um, off Fulham. Of that relegation zone as well. West Ham versus Leicester, probably the biggest game of the season, uh, biggest game of the season, biggest game of the weekend in terms of league positions. It would have been like a touch on before the, the the round of fixtures of the weekend started. It was fourth versus third at the time. I think it ended up being sixth versus third. Um, and West Ham had come out on top, won the game three two. The game went raced to a sort of three 0 lead. Jesse Lingard doing Jesse Lingard things. Um, if you honestly if he continues like this, he's in the English squad for me. Like. He's just, he offers us something a little bit different as well in terms of he's got running um, power and can run beyond the advanced players. Like You've got a lot of technical players. It's another story altogether, but you've got Madison, you've got Mount, for example, and Foden. They're all more technical players um, who like to get the ball and feed the advanced players, whereas I think Jesse can run beyond, um, which is obviously a different type of attribute to have. And actually getting a couple of goals back for Leicester, who's in obviously great form at the minute. Um, and disappointing result for Leicester, obviously... Again, it's a speculation. I think it's quite true, though. But a lot of Leicester play a lot. Four players slash three slash four players missed the game through COVID or breaking COVID rules. Um, Madison Chowdhury and I think Jose Perez apparently they attended a indoor party, um, which obviously there's boundaries and, and rules that the club of you've got to stick to. And you know they've been punished, going to train by themselves for, throughout the weekend. They're going to rejoin the group probably as of sort of today in the lead up to the semi-final of the Cup. Um, so yeah, that moved West Ham back into fourth position. Only a point behind Leicester, so they're a point behind third position. And could it happen? I mean, it's that tight. It could go either way. I mean, West Ham could finish third, but they could finish sixth or seventh. Um, and like with Leicester, the way they've sort of, their form dipped a little bit, they could finish third, but they could finish sixth as well or seventh. So very, very tight. Spurs versus Man United, and this is huge to even condense the league even further. So, if Spurs won this game, they would have gone on to 50 points, and Man United would have stayed on 60. So, from second down to seventh, it would have been 10 points, which is a decent amount of points. But there's, with the result, the game sort of head heads in terms of who got to play each other. Um, it would have condensed the league even further. But United have come out top 3 1 wins, uh, winner, sorry. Touched on the Cavani, disallowed goal, we not talk about that anymore. But he did actually get his head later on in the game. Brilliant movement. Lovely ball in for Green, but just sort of crested it and whipped it in. And that's a dream, dream bone of a ball in, to be honest with you. Um, Green would obviously score late on as well. And the surprise score on Fred, who doesn't score very often. It's his second goal in the Premier League since he's joined. Um, and the fact that Scott McTominay brought it up in his post match interview, and so, so does Ollie as well, says, you know, says that a lot really about his goal scoring or lack of goal scoring prowess. Um, so they're probably, mathematically doesn't, they probably secure Man United's second position in the league, um, given their goal difference as well. Seven points ahead of third, plus I think eight or nine plus 
Cardiff is ahead on third position, so realistically he's third position or fourth or fifth. I've got to win three extra games um, to get ahead of United because two draws and so two wins and a draw would only bring them level. Um, so realistically they need that extra point to sort of get ahead of them because of the goal difference. Um, and then Sheffield United versus Arsenal, 3 0 to Arsenal, lack of squad brace of Martinelli, good to see him back um, and on the goal scoring um, charts. And then moving on to the Monday night game, Valencia, any of these games, what sort of the, uh, obviously the score lines, good win for West Brom, back to back W's, that's huge, it gives them, it just increases their odds a little bit further, their belief a little bit further, or um, possibly chasing and, and, and clawing back on one of the teams that are outside the relegation zone. They're actually in two points behind Fulham now, so. Potentially, how the results go next week, they could be ahead of Fulham in the league as well, which I wouldn't have thought that a few weeks ago. Um, goals coming from Phillips, Pereira, and I think Robinson scored as well. Uh, I think Ward Prowse had a penalty missed also. And then the last game, Brighton versus Everton, it was a nil nil. Can't really comment about it too much, other than it was a disappointing, a good point for Brighton in terms of they've gained a point. But looking at statistics and statistics alone, I know they can be misleading, they just sort of did dominate the game and had quite a few chances. Um, and then from Everton's point of view, obviously they're fighting for European positions as well. If they've won the game, they're going to head of Spurs on to 50 with a game in hand. Win that 53, they go ahead of Liverpool. I think possibly even Chelsea as well. Could be wrong there, but obviously they didn't. They're going to move on to 48. I think they win their next game, which is against Aston Villa, I believe. Um, so they came in hand, which was against Aston Villa. Moving to 51, they could move up one or two positions in the league. All ifs and buts, but um, yeah, I won't comment about it too much. Just going to quickly touch on game week 32 fixtures now. So, first game is Everton versus Spurs. Um, that's a five-night game. Huge game in terms of European positions again. Uh, I think... Will Everton have DCL back? I don't know. If he's missing, then obviously Spurs would be favourites. And probably Spurs are marginally favourites anyway, but it just makes them even heavier favourites going into the game. Arguably the best game of the weekend um, on the Monday night, Leeds versus Liverpool. Brilliant to have it on a Monday night game, more views are better. Um, you remember this was the reverse of the opening game of the season, obviously Liverpool won the game 4-3 and it was an epic game. And I think it's kicked off the beginning of the Premier League season as well, so you can just imagine this game being like this. It's constant, like suits both teams kind of thing. Um, moving on to Thursday, uh, Leicester versus West Brom, Leicester the fourth team who actually play in the... Um, in FA Cup, so um, the other team was Southampton, by the way. So they're playing West Brom, nice fixture, certainly on paper for Leicester. However, obviously West Brom won the last two games, obviously gone to Stamford Bridge two games ago and won five two. So maybe it's more difficult than it suggests, but um, Leicester certainly in favourites going into the game, and they're probably again depending on how they got on in the FA Cup semi final, they could be absolutely bouncing into this game, you know. Potentially beating Southampton in the semis in a cup final can have one or two players, but like the likes of Madison and Perez, and if he's even talked that Harvey Barnes could be back as well, but we're not sure about that. Yeah, so that's obviously game 31, uh, 32 fixtures, which we'll talk about next week in more detail. Guys, that concludes another episode of the Premier League Appetite Show. Touching that earlier, please leave a like on the video. It does reach more people in terms of the YouTube fees and timelines. And therefore, obviously, we get more views and hopefully on the back of that, more subscribers. It's just how the YouTube algorithm works. Obviously, leave a comment as well. What do you think to some of my thoughts in terms of, you know, the Sonny incident and the, the Scott McTominay incident, Solskjaer's comments and Jose's comments on the back of that as well. Um, yeah, and we'll see everyone next week.